Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean, your host. Website can be found at www.scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to support the mission of truth. That's where you go to find the archives and lots of other things. Thank you for joining me this morning. We are resuming our study in the Gospel according to Mark. We're ready for chapter 9, which deals with the transfiguration. And uh, so that's kind of what it starts with. Uh, Several times Jesus foretells his death and resurrection, but the disciples just do not get it. And the chapter ends with a solemn warning about hell. And so it's a... It's not, you know, like a super long chapter, but it is filled with lots of important information uh, that we're going to dig into this morning. As usual, my prayer is that the, this would go forth, it would pierce hearts, it would cause many to fall on their faces before God and before His Son, Jesus. And so open up your hearts, and let's dig in and see what the Gospel according to Mark would say to us this morning. Let's begin. King James Bible, verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things he had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one another, what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must come first? And he answered, and he told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things, and be set at naught. But I say unto you, that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. All right, please note. The disciples are asking Jesus, so first of all, they see this transfiguration, which is, you know, just one of those amazing things, and uh, it's hard to imagine what this is all about, right? Uh, but they see this happening. They see what the King James Bible says is Elias and Moses. Of course, when the King James is talking about Elias right here, it's talking about the prophet Elijah. After that's all over, and they're coming down the mountain, they say, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Like, what is that all about? And uh, first of all, we need to understand where that comes from. So I've got two passages for you, both from Malachi. So if we go to Malachi chapter 3, the very first verse says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall repair the way for me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 makes it clear who's coming. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay. Now, the Bible sometimes is symbolic. So, everyone was literally waiting for 
Elijah literally, right? And so they're asking Jesus, now that they've seen Elijah on the mountain appear with Moses, with Jesus, they say, why did the scribes say, you know, why did they say that Elijah's going to come first? Okay, so this is where the scribes are getting it. They're getting from Malachi. But Jesus says, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said it not. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done to him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. So Jesus is saying Elijah's already came. Now in the book of Matthew, uh, Jesus makes this very, very clear. And there's no debating who it was. He says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 14, And if you will receive it, this is Elias with which was for to come. Who's he talking about here? Look at Luke. And he shall go, well, not Luke, I'm sorry, go to Matthew 17. But I say unto you, that Elias is come already, and they knew him not. But have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was the Elijah to come. That was going to prepare a way for the Lord. In Luke chapter 1 verse 17. And he shall go before them in spirit and power of Elijah. And turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the, of the just to make the people prepared for the Lord. So all this time, what they have been waiting on was John the Baptist, but they recognized him not, and instead he ended up getting killed, right? Interesting enough, with, the pa- with Passover, one of the Jewish customs is to set out an extra plate for Elijah. So they don't get that Elijah has come already. And it was John the Baptist, and he prepared the way for the Lord. And that is according to Jesus himself. So this isn't just me coming up with something. This isn't just some commentary of some Christian or some pastor. Jesus himself says that that Elijah has come already. And the Bible says that then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So hopefully that brings some clarity to that if you've been confused about it. Let's continue on with verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with him, with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And whatsoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and he gnashes his teeth, and he pineth away. And I spake unto thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered them, and he saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him, them unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into a fire and into waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If thou can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Please note, this is one of my favorite verses. This man has a child that's been throwing himself on the ground and gnashing and throwing himself into fire and throwing himself into water. The father recognizes that it's obviously a spirit, an evil spirit has possessed the child. He brings him to Jesus. Jesus, if you can help, please do. Jesus says, if you'll believe, anything is possible. And the man cries out and says, I believe, but help my unbelief. And this, I got to be honest, this is a prayer I've prayed many times. Lord, help my unbelief. 
Lord, help my unbelief. I believe. Like, I believe. I know you can do this, but I'm still struggling a little bit with belief in this area. Please help my unbelief. I just think it's a beautiful picture. This man is recognizing that, yes, it takes faith. Yes, I believe. But I also understand that my faith comes from the source. And so he's he's asking the Lord to help his unbelief. And I just think that's just a beautiful, beautiful verse there. Let me read it again. And straight away the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Verse 25. And when Jesus saw that the people come running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Please note, that's interesting. Jesus is saying, look, there's some spirits that aren't coming out except for by one way. Like you can't just command them to come out. This kind, meaning that there's multiple kinds, this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Very interesting. You know, there's some thing. We're in a spiritual war. And the weapon that he, there's only one weapon that works on this kind of spirit, and that's prayer and fasting. Unless you're the son of God, then of course you can just tell it to come out, but the rest of us don't have that authority. This kind comes out by prayer and fasting, Jesus says. He says to his disciples, you couldn't cast it out because this kind comes forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. This is prayer and fasting is a lost art on the church. It's like people struggle just to pray, much less deny themselves anything. We need to get back to understanding the power of prayer and fasting. Let's continue on. And they parted thence, passed through Galilee. And he would not that any man should know it. And he taught his disciples, and he said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise on the third day. But they understood not the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And he came to Capernaum. And being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he saith unto them, If any man desireth to be first, the same shall be last of all, and the servant of all. He took a child, and he set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him by his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receiveth me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And John answered and saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, and we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do miracles in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And whosoever... Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. I think it's important to note quickly. Jesus takes it seriously when you 
harm a child specific, well, in any form, in any way, but he's, I believe he's specifically talking about harming a child's faith in this instance. So woe unto all the teachers, woe unto all the professors that go in and try to steal the faith of a child. Woe unto them. Great is your destruction. Great is your punishment and judgment that is coming. Woe to those who would take a child's faith and insert lies and deceit to try to warp that child's way of thinking. Jesus says, And to whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believeth in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. In the book of Matthew, he says, But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believeth in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18.10 Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Luke chapter 17. And he said unto these disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying it would be better for you literally that a big rock was tied around your neck and you were dropped in the sea than if you were to offend one of these little ones who believes in me. So all these professors, all these teachers who have led one astray, who have taken a Christian child and led him to the depths of hell, your judgment is going to be beyond comprehension. Let's continue on. Verse 43. He's, he's warning of hell at this point. He's telling the people that offend children, who cause, you know, especially those who believe in him, you're in, you're in some serious danger. And then he goes on, verse 43, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into the life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace with one another. By the way, but this is the end of chapter 9, but we're going to talk about this for just a few minutes here before we wrap it up. Something that Jesus wants you to know about hell. He says, Into the fire that shall never be quenched. That's the first time. Where the worm dieth and not, the fire is not quenched. There's the second time. Again, he says, Be cast into hell, never shall it be quenched. There's three times. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Four times. It's better to have two eyes. It's better to have you know enter into the kingdom of uh, kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and cast into fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Five times in this little tiny section does he say that the fire will not be quenched. Make no mistake, hell is real, and it's a fire. That's where and the worm doesn't even die. But the fire's not quenched. It's just never-ending torment. Now, Jesus is saying, hey, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your foot offends you, cut it off. If your eye is offending you, gouge it out. It's better to enter into heaven without these things than to enter into hellfire, right? Is Jesus literally saying, chop your hand off and your foot off and gouge your eye out? 
The answer is no. This is symbolic. What is he saying? He's saying, if you've got to cut the sin off at the source. If there's a app on your phone that you keep looking at, but it causes you to, if it causes to lead you down a path of pornography or something of that nature, you gotta cut it off. You gotta stop it at the source. This is what Jesus is getting at. If Netflix is causing you to sin, you got you need to cancel that. If you can't handle, you know, there's insert whatever your struggle is. Jesus is saying, "Hey, you need to cut it off at the source." You're, look, it's better going into heaven with one hand with only having one hand and to have both, but enter into hell where the fire is never quenched. He's saying, cut the sin off at the source. This is a spiritual discipline that seems to be lost on many. It's like, well, you know, I never, I don't set out to do this thing, but every time I go here, I end up doing that. Well, then you stop going there. Problem solved. But you have to have some self-control, which is a spiritual discipline, right? A fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. People, you know, sometimes they don't realize. You know, they sometimes usually sin is several decisions made, right? starts with something small that you might not even recognize as the thing that leads you to the next step, which leads you to the next step, which leads you to the next step. You got to figure out what that first step is and cut it off right there. I use pornography as an example because it's one of the easiest ones to describe. It may start with you're watching something that's rated R on Netflix that stimulates your mind. Next thing you know, you're looking at it somewhere else. Maybe it started there. Or maybe you're just looking at something on social media. And then something triggers you. And then you're looking at a deeper thing and a darker thing and a darker thing. Before you know it, you're full on. Cut it off at the source. Jesus is saying it's better. (laughs) It's better to enter into the kingdom maimed. Or with one eye, than to enter in to hellfire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Well, I pray that you've been blessed this morning. I hope that your hearts have been pierced and that it's causing you to draw ever more closely to God and to His Son Jesus. These are challenging times that we're living in. And you need to be on top of your faith. You need to be on top of your spiritual disciplines. This is no joke. The Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into him and they are saved. Thanks for listening this morning. Thanks for those of you who support this mission and make it possible. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you for your prayers and sharing the podcast and all those things peace and grace be upon you. And until next time, God bless.